so guys the three month LIBOR is given to be 5% in the question the six month LIBOR is given to be 6% first part asks us to compute the contract rate or the fair price of a 3 into 6 FRA that is a 3 month contract or a 3 month loan that will be taken 3 months later 6 minus 3 will be the duration of the loan and the first digit that is this 3 is how many months later will the loan be taken that's the first part the second part says that one month later the two month LIBOR now is given to be 6% and the five month LIBOR is given to be 7% and the question asks compute the value of the first FRA that we had entered assuming we had entered this for the long counterparty is not long in an FRA means the borrower or the person who will be taking this loan three months later for a period of three months now let's solve the first part first that is compute the rate of a 3 into 6 FRA given these rates so if today I was to borrow for a period of six months the rate applicable would be six percent that is a six month borrowing could be completed by paying at the end of six months one plus point zero six into six by twelve let's assume I borrowed one dollar instead of borrowing this one dollar for the entire six months I could have borrowed it for three months and then refinanced it for another three months so if I borrowed one dollar for three months then at the end of three months I would have had to pay one plus 0 0.05 into 3 by 12 since it's a three month borrowing and after this I would have had to borrow this entire amount for another three months because I originally wanted to compute or culminate a six month borrowing so this entire amount would have to be borrowed for another six months or rather another three months the rate applicable now would be the three month rate three month from now or it will be the forward rate 3 into 6 this is what we have to calculate these two must be the same otherwise there will be an arbitrage opportunity please note rates always are annualized so whatever this annualized rate would be has to be multiplied by 3 by 12 to get us the interest that we will have to pay for 3 months because we are borrowing for 3 months so with this equation we can solve for FRA 3 into 6 or what would be the fair contracted rate on this 3 into 6 FRA so please verify that the current 3 month rate 3 months from now 6 minus 3 3 month rate 3 months from now comes out to be 6.914 percent that is two counterparties today if they enter into this FRA have agreed that one counterparty will borrow at this rate and the other counterparty will lend at this rate the person who is borrowing has the view that rates or is scared that the rates may go up the person who is lending has the view that rates may go down three months later whatever is the actual rate will decide the payoff on this FRA as we studied in the previous examples however one month has now passed expiration of this FRA will happen three months later and we'll compare it with the actual rate the rate of 6.914 to compute our payoff but one month has passed and the interest rates have fluctuated can they fluctuate yes now the two month LIBOR is given to be 6% and 
and the five month LIBOR is given to be 7% and we are asked the value of this FRA. Please note, to begin with, this was a 3 into 6 FRA, that is we are at t equal to 0. Three months later, we will borrow for a period of three months and hence the 3 into 6 FRA. One month has now passed, so we are at t equal to 1. Now, this FRA or the same contract will expire two months later and will still be a three month contract. So, if we need the current rate for similar contracts, then we need the rate for a 2 into 5 FRA because a 2 into 5 FRA would be corresponding to our contract that we had entered one month earlier or two months later we want the three month borrowing rate. Please note that if we are long the FRA that means we are borrowing let's say at the rate of 6.91 percent if we were long the first FRA. One month later if we want to exit this contract that is we don't want to be in the FRA any more then we simply need to short a corresponding maturity contract that is we need to short a 2 into 5 FRA. A short 2 into 5 FRA at t equal to 1 would mean that you are lending. You are lending 2 months later for a period of 3 months hence 2 into 5, 5 minus 2 is equal to 3. I was already long a 3 into 6 FRA that was I was already scheduled to be borrowing three months later for a period of three months and now I have shot a similar agreement. So when t equal to three actually comes because of this long uh, three into six that I had already done I will have to borrow at 6.91 percent because I have contracted this Come what may, this is a right as well as an obligation, it's a forward contract. But I have also short a 2 into 5 FRA. Then at t equal to 3, that is 2 months later, I will also have to lend. So I will borrow at 6.91% and I will lend at whatever is this rate. I can log in this rate also right now. If this rate is higher than 6.91, that means I have gained. If this rate is lower than 6.91, that means I have lost. The value to the long will always exactly be the opposite of the value to the short. Question asked is that one month has passed. Two months are still remaining to the expiration of this contract. Today itself, are you in the money or out of the money? Just like I purchased a stock for $100, my idea was to hold it for one year. Two months later, the stock has gone up by 20%. So two months later, can I calculate my mark to market gain? Even though I'm not selling it. But if I want, I can sell it today and lock in this profit. That's what we're doing. This contract is expiring three months later. But one month later, I'm checking, am I in the money or am I out of the money? And if I want, I can short a 2 into 5 FRN, completely extinguish the contract itself. That is, I have borrowed, I also lend. So whatever I borrow will just go into that lending and my position is now secured because my borrowing rate is also fixed. And once I fix this lending rate also, then is there any risk in the position further? Because I'm borrowing at 6.9, I'm lending at a fixed rate. Let's see what is this rate at which I can lend at now. This rate now will be the rate of a 2 into 5 FRA. We'll solve it in the same manner. If we were to consummate a five month borrowing today, then the rate applicable would be 7%. So if we borrowed $1 for a period of five months, then after five months, I would have to pay 1 plus 0 0.07 into 5 by 12. Please note rates are annual. So if your time period is anything different than one year, then you'll have to make a time adjustment. 
in annual compounding you would raise it to the power 5 by 12 in LIBOR the convention is actual by 360 here actual number of days in the month is not given so we'll assume 1 month and 12 months in a year so 5 by 12 instead of this I could borrow for 2 months if I borrowed for 2 months I would have had to pay 1 plus 0 0.02 into 2 by 12 rather 1 plus 0 0.06 into 2 by 12 and I could have refinanced it for another 3 months because I want to complete a 5 month borrowing the rate applicable there would be the 3 month rate 2 months from now because I am going 2 months forward instead of borrowing for 5 months I can borrow for 2 months and then refinance for another 3 months so it will be 1 plus whatever is the rate two months later for a borrowing of three months five minus two would be three multiplied by three divided by twelve because it is a three month borrowing please note total I'm doing a five month borrowing in both cases five months here and three plus two five months here also again we can solve this equation and compute the value of f2 into five So please verify that F2 into 5 will come out to be 7.59%. That means that 2 months later, if I am the long counterparty, then I am scheduled to borrow at the rate of 6.91%. And if I today short this 2 into 5 FRA, then I will lend at the rate of 7.59% so I will borrow at 6.9% and lend at 7.6% or 7.59% if today I enter this short agreement then what will my payoff be I will borrow a fixed amount or I will borrow a notional let's assume the notional is n at the rate of 6.9 and simultaneously I will lend it at 7.59 for a period of 3 months so 3 months later is when the interest will be received and will be paid so 3 months later on the borrowing of n I will pay 0 0.0759 into 3 by 12 please note it's a 3 month borrowing rather I will receive 0 0.0759 into 3 by 12 and I'll have to pay 0 0.0691 into 3 by 12 so this will be my profit the notional amount into this difference however this is the profit when is it the profit at t equal to 1 or is it the profit at t equal to 6 this is the profit at t equal to 6 when we solved for the value of the FRA at expiration, we discounted it back 3 months. That's why that division of 1 plus L into 3 by 12 or whatever is the period came. The interest will be exchanged at T equal to 6 itself. However, we are now asked to calculate the value at T equal to 1 or at T equal to 3. We are at a position 1 month later. So we need the value of this FRA at t equal to 1. At t equal to 1, we can see that today itself, if I execute the way we discussed, I can lock in this profit 5 months later, that is at t equal to 6. So the value today would be this entire payoff discounted back 5 months. So this value or this the value of this difference at t equal to 1 would be equal to this amount that is my profit discounted back by 1 plus the 5 month rate into 5 by 12 or it will come out to be n into 0 0.0759 minus 0 0.0 
zero six nine one into three by twelve divided by one plus the five month rate is what seven percent. So that will always be the current spot rate that I need for discounting back. Point zero seven into five by twelve will be the value at t equal to one. So this will be the final answer if n was let's assume given to be hundred million dollars, or the notional is given to be hundred million dollars, then you can actually numerically calculate the answer. So just put hundred million in in place of n and calculate the answer that the value of the FRA to the long will be equal to. Please verify that this will come out to be approximately 0.165 million dollars, or the value of the FRA or the first FRA after one month to the long counterparty would be plus 0.165 million dollars. If the question asks the value to the short, it would just be minus 0.165 million dollars. Remember, derivatives, be it fixed income derivatives or Stock derivatives are always a zero-sum game. The value to the short is exactly equal and opposite to the value of the long. The next fixed income derivative that we'll study is referred to as a swap agreement. Before we understand swaps in more details, we'll understand the reason to enter this derivative. That is the theory of comparative advantage. The so theory of comparative advantage says that individuals and even countries should focus on activities that they have a comparative advantage in, and then swap for the other things that they need. So we need food also. We need machinery also. All countries need food as well as machinery. Theory of comparative advantage says that. Countries that have skill in developing food should only develop food, and countries that have skill in developing machinery should only develop machinery, and then they should trade or they should swap food for machines. That will be in the best interest of everybody, or they will be able to both create value for themselves. In the case of fixed income instruments and fixed income derivatives. we will see the theory of comparative advantage in the context of interest rates so let's assume that a counterparty a borrows at a fixed rate at the rate of 10% he has a good credit rating and a good standing with the banks so the banks are willing to lend to him at a fixed rate of 10% he can borrow at a floating rate of libor plus 0.3% or l plus 0. 3 is a spread that banks are charging him libor practically is a risk free rate so a marginal spread is being charged for company a company b is being lent to at a fixed rate of 11.2% and a floating rate of libor plus 1% now a in this scenario has an absolute advantage in both borrowings or in both markets in the fixed market as well as the floating market he has an absolute advantage because his borrowing rate is lower in both markets he however has a relative advantage in wherever the difference is higher or wherever the benefit is more so let's see in the fixed borrowing his rate is lower to the extent of 1.2% or 120 basis points in the floating market his rate is lower but lower only to the extent of 0.7% or 70 basis points hence a has a relative advantage in the fixed market while b has a relative advantage in the floating market or automatically b has a relative advantage in the floating market or in the market that a does not have a relative advantage in so theory says that a should only do his borrowing at a fixed rate even if he needs a floating rate 
borrowing even if he wants to borrow at the floating rate he should still do a fixed rate borrowing b should always do a floating rate borrowing even if he needs a fixed he should just swap with a that is a can give him the fixed borrowing and a can take the floating borrowing from b they will both still be better off as we will prove in a little while to explain with another real life example let's assume there is a lawyer and the lawyer has a secretary on practicing law the lawyer scores 90 on 100 the secretary has been working with the lawyer so she's also understood a little bit of law but is nowhere close to where the lawyer is so she scores a 10 on 100 as far as practicing law is concerned the lawyer went to law school, made a lot of assignments. So as far as typing speed is concerned, on a similar scale or a comparable scale, lawyer scores pretty well on typing as well. So he scores 80 on 100 as far as typing skills are concerned. The secretary is also quite good at typing, but she's still marginally lesser if it only comes to typing. So she scores a 75 on 100 as far as typing is concerned. Again, in this case, the lawyer has an absolute advantage in practicing law as well as typing. But the lawyer has a relative advantage in practicing law because he scores 80 points more. The secretary automatically has a relative advantage in typing because the lawyer has a relative advantage in practicing law. Theory says that lawyer should not try to do both things. It will be a loss in value if he tries to practice law as well as type. He should focus on the activity that he has a comparative advantage in. He has a comparative advantage in practicing law. He should spend all his time in practicing law. Whereas the secretary should not invest her time in practicing law. She should invest all her time in typing because she has a relative advantage in typing. That is how they will be able to maximize value to each other. Now coming back to our example of interest, interest rates, let's see how the company can maximize value or how the company can or the two companies can reduce their borrowing rates by following the theory of comparative advantage. Now let's assume that company A needs a floating rate loan and company B needs a fixed rate loan. So this is company A and this is company B. The company B has some relationship with its bank. Company A and company B also has some relationship with its bank. Now A needs a floating rate borrowing. But what we suggest is that A should always borrow in the fixed. So if A borrows in the fixed, so let's say it takes $100, it will have to pay its bank a fixed rate of 10%. Actually, he wanted floating and he was willing to pay LIBOR plus 0.3, but we are saying, never mind, just pay a fixed rate of 10%. B wanted to borrow floating rather he wanted to borrow fixed but we say that he must always borrow floating because he has a relative advantage in floating so b also borrows hundred dollars however at the floating rate of interest so b borrows hundred dollars at a floating rate hence he will pay to his bank libor plus one percent because that's his floating rate so what we suggest these two is that they should swap the payments. That is, A should simply send this $100 to B and B should send these $100 to A. So let's assume A gives B a fixed rate loan and B gives him 10%. So A swaps this hundred dollars to B and B agrees to pay him 10% fixed. And what B does is that 
B swaps the hundred dollars to A, or B gives the hundred dollars to A, and A is willing to give him LIBOR plus point zero five percent. How I thought of this point zero five, I'll just come to, but just understand or just assume for now that A agrees to give LIBOR plus point zero five. So they borrowed from their banks originally. Then A gave the money to B, and B gave the money to A. Doesn't matter because same hundred dollars. A gives them hundred dollars. B gives hundred dollars. It doesn't matter. After that, for the hundred dollars that B has taken, B pays ten percent. For the hundred dollars that A has taken from B, A pays LIBOR plus point zero five percent. Assuming this arrangement. Compute the net borrowing cost for A or the net interest rate for A as well as for B. For A, he still has to pay ten percent to the bank, but fortunately he is getting that ten percent from B, so this gets cancelled. At the end, his borrowing cost is only LIBOR plus point zero five percent. So A is able to borrow at a floating rate of LIBOR plus. Point zero five. Well, that's what A is able to do. Otherwise, his floating rate cost would have been how much? LIBOR plus point three. So, how much has A gained? Point two five percent or twenty five basis points. This is the gain for A by entering the swap agreement. For B, he has to pay LIBOR plus one percent to his bank. But a part of it, LIBOR plus point zero five is coming from A. So basically, to his bank, in the net, he only has to pay point nine five percent. So point nine five percent he pays to his bank, and another ten percent he has to pay to A for the swap agreement that he entered into. So his total borrowing cost will be ten percent plus point nine five. That is ten point nine five percent. So B is able to borrow at a fixed rate of ten point nine five percent. Otherwise, B would have borrowed at what rate? Eleven point two percent. That is, B has reduced his borrowing cost by point two five percent. So both A and B, by entering into the swap, have been able to reduce their borrowing cost by twenty five bips in cumulative. The two companies' the savings has been to the extent of fifty basis points or point five percent. Please remember, by entering into a swap, the total borrowing cost for the two counterparties can be reduced by the difference of the difference. Let's understand. The difference is how much? One point two percent in fixed and point seven percent in Floating difference of the difference would be one point two minus point seven. That is point five percent. By entering into a swap, both counterparties can reduce their borrowing costs by the difference of the difference. That is one point two minus point seven point five. In my example, I split that difference equally between A and B. That need not be the case. When I chose 0.05 here, when I said LIBOR plus 0.05, that ensured that there's a 25 bips benefit going to either counterparty. If I made this LIBOR plus 0.1, then please verify B would have gotten a 30 bips benefit, A would have gotten only a 20 bips benefit. If I made this LIBOR only LIBOR, then A would have gotten a 30 bips benefit. B would have gotten a 20 bips benefit. So, total cost can be reduced by 50 basis points. That is the difference of the difference. How it is split will depend on will depend on the bargaining power of the counterparties. Who needs whose help more, etc., etc. But the objective is to prove the advantages of swaps. Now, understand the swap agreement that has happened. Okay. What they have done to their banks is not relevant for the swap part of this contract. 
the swap part of this arrangement is when b gives a loan to a and agrees to receive floating interest a gives a loan to b so b gives a hundred dollars and says pay me libor plus 0 0.05 a gives b hundred dollars hundred dollars that he got from here that doesn't matter a gives b hundred dollars and agrees to pay or agrees to receive 10 percent this is referred to as a fixed for floating swap a is the fixed rate receiver and floating rate payer b is the fixed rate payer and the floating rate receiver this is called a fixed for floating swap please note right at the beginning of the swap a gave b hundred dollars and charged ten percent b gave a hundred dollars and charged LIBOR plus 0.05 percent at the end of the swap a will return back the borrowing or rather the hundred dollars and b will also return back the borrowing that is hundred dollars now theoretically these notionals should be exchanged but a gives b hundred dollars and b gives a hundred dollars does it make any difference i give you ten dollars and you give me ten dollars back so remember in plain vanilla interest rate swaps this is an example of a plain vanilla interest rate swap notionals need not be exchanged so what we just discussed was a theory of comparative advantage and the structure of a plain vanilla interest rate swap this diagram depicts the cash flows on a three-year annual pay fixed for floating swap wherein the fixed rate is fixed at 5.5 percent so at the end of the first year the fixed rate payer will pay 5.5% and receive whatever is the LIBOR. So he will receive the LIBOR that was at the beginning of the period. So at this point, that is at t equal to 0, whatever was the one year rate is what the floating receiver will receive at the end of the first year. The fixed rate receiver will always receive the fixed rate. The floating rate is the rate that can keep changing. After one year, that is at t equal to 1, this rate or this LIBOR, the one year LIBOR will again change. Here what the LIBOR was, so we will always look at if it's a one year or it's an annual pay swap, then we will always look at the one year rate. We don't want the six month rate or the two year rate. We will look at the one year rate at different points in time. That is for one year borrowing or lending, what is the rate that banks are charging? That rate will change every day. It is a one year rate, but it will change every day. That is today for accepting one year deposits, what are the banks charging? So we will first look at the one year rate at t equal to zero. That is the value that will be paid by the fixed rate payer or received by the fixed rate receiver at the end of t equal to one. At t equal to 2, we will again check the one year rate at t equal to 1. So whatever is the LIBOR here now, the one year rate at t equal to 1, standing here we can think of it as the one year rate, one year from now, is the value that will be exchanged at t equal to 2. That is what the floating rate payer will have to pay the fixed rate payer will always pay 5.5 percent or the fixed rate receiver will always receive 5.5 percent similarly at t equal to 3 he will receive whatever is the one year rate two years from now so whatever is this rate this floating rate will keep change changing that's why it's a floating rate so whatever is the one year rate two years from now is what will be given by the fixed or the floating rate payer and will be received by the floating rate receiver at t equal to 3. So this is how the cash flows 
on a fixed for floating swap work at the beginning we should have exchanged the notionals so at the end the floating rate pair will give back the 100 million dollars because he has been paying the interest he has to also repay the principal at the end similarly the fixed rate receiver or the fixed rate payer will pay his 5.5 percent and at the end also pay back his 100 million dollars because he also has to pay back the interest now this 5.5 percent in this swap in this three-year swap we saw the fixed rate was 5.5 percent this 5.5 percent will actually depend on the expectations of the floating rates if floating rates are in, in the future are expected to be high then the fixed rate receiver will charge a higher fixed rate because he knows he has to pay the floating rate and if the floating rate is going to be high or is expected to be high then even the fixed rate that he'll charge will be high if floating rates are expected to be low then even the fixed rate will be low so remember the pricing of a plain vanilla interest rate swap or the pricing of a fixed for floating swap basically is answering the question that what should be this fixed rate this fixed rate will depend on the expectations of the floating rates in the future if the expectations of the rates go up or if current spot rates are high if the spot curve is upward sloping upward sloping spot curve means as we discussed in the previous session it means or in, as we discussed in fixed income that the expectations of future short term rates are higher so in such a case the fixed rate will also be high because expectations of future one year rates that's what the he'll have to pay the floating rate payer will have to pay future short term rates or future one year rates whatever is the one year rate here will have to be paid at equal to 2 whatever is the one year rate here will have to be paid at equal to 3 so this fixed rate depends on the expectations of future short term rates now let's try to price a 3 year fixed for floating swap pricing of a derivative remains the same so pricing of a swap is the same as pricing any other derivative first depict the cash flows that is calculate the cash flows and then discount them back to compute the value of the swap today so we can think of ourselves as the fixed rate payer or the fixed rate receiver it doesn't matter the value will still come out to be the same so let's see the perspective of the fixed rate pair and let's try to see his cash flows so the fixed rate pair at the end of t equal to 1 let's assume we are at t equal to 0 at the end of t equal to 1 we'll have to pay c that is the fixed rate into the notional let's say the fixed rate is 5 percent so 5 percent into 100 million dollars is what he'll have to pay at the end of the first year similarly at the end of the second year he'll have to pay the fixed rate into the notionals and at the end of the third year he'll have to pay the fixed rate into the notional and he will also have to repay back the principal or the notional amount he's the fixed rate payer automatically means that he is the floating rate receiver so these will be his outflows but he will also have some inflows at the end of t equal to 1 he will receive whatever was the one year rate today 1 minus 0 that is the one year rate at t equal to 0 that is today multiplied by the notional at t equal to 2 he will receive whatever is the floating rate at t equal to 1 nobody knows so we don't know that but he will receive whatever is the floating rate at t equal to 1 that will be 
whatever is the one year rate one year from now multiplied by the notional and at t equal to 3 he will receive whatever is the one year rate two years from now multiplied by the notional and he will also receive back his principal that he would have swapped so in the beginning he gave n and he received n so he pays back is n and he receives also the n that's why we say this n will get cancelled it doesn't really need to be swapped so these are his cash inflows and these are his cash outflows the value of the swap like the value of any other instrument will be the present value of the cash inflows minus the present value of the cash outflows now his inflows have the same cash flows as a floating rate bond so a three year floating rate bond had I purchased I would have had the exact same cash flows this is nothing but a floating rate bond his cash outflows likewise are exactly similar to the payoff on a fixed rate bond that is had he issued a fixed rate bond he had borrowed hundred dollars and he had issued a fixed rate bond then again his cash flows would have been coupon into the face value and at maturity coupon plus par value so you can say that being a fixed rate pair is akin to having a long position in a floating bond and a short position in a fixed rate bond minus means short position in a fixed rate bond so to compute the value of the swap you have to just calculate the value of the floating bond and subtract from it the value of the fixed bond subtract because we are short the fixed bond we are paying the coupon and the principal so let's try to calculate the present value of both these bonds or both these legs this cash flow is coming in and going out at t equal to 1 so it will be discounted back by whatever is the one year spot rate today it's coming one year later so it will be discounted back by the one year spot rate this cash flow would similarly be discounted back by the two year spot rate please note rates are annualized so it will be one upon one plus r2 to the power two this cash flow is coming three years later so it will be discounted back by the three year rate Similarly, this cash flow is also going out three years later, so it will also be discounted back by 1 plus R3 to the power 3. Now, please note, as we discussed when we studied the forward rate and the forward rate agreement, 1 plus R3 to the power 3 or a three year borrowing can be thought of as a two year borrowing refinanced for one more year this will be into one plus the one year rate two years from now so one plus r3 to the power three can be written as one plus r2 to the power two into one plus l2 into three that is the one year rate two years from now please note again that n can come out common from the numerator and if I take n common this will again become n into 1 plus l 2 into 3 so what this term will simplify down to is that 1 plus l 2 into 3 will get cancelled what will remain is n 
upon 1 plus r2 to the power 2. Because 1 plus r3 to the power 3 can be written as 1 plus r2 square into 1 plus l2 into 3. Similarly, 1 plus r2 to the power 2 will now be common. So this will be 1 plus r2 to the power 2 into n will come out from the third term and l1 into 2 into n will come out common from the second term. The denominator is the same, it is 1 plus r2 to the power 2. 1 plus r2 to the power 2, that is a 2 year borrowing, can be thought of as a 1 year borrowing, refinanced for 1 more year into 1 plus l1 into 2. So the denominator can be written as 1 plus r1 into 1 plus l1 into 2. And then in the numerator n will come common again. So this will be n into 1 plus l1 into 2. So these two terms again will now simplify to n upon 1 plus r1 to the power 1. They will again come common 1 plus r1 to the power 1 will come common and this will be LO1 means R1 only. Do we understand? The one year rate today is the today's spot rate. So this will again be N into 1 plus R1 or this will just become N. What we have just derived or what we have just proved is that the value of a floating rate bond at any reset date that is at any date where the coupon is being decided floating rate bond doesn't mean coupon will change every day coupon will be decided at particular points in time at t equal to 1 whatever is the one year rate at t equal to 2 whatever is the one year rate and at t equal to 3 rather at t equal to 0 what is the one year rate t equal to 1 what is, what is the one year rate and t equal to 2 what is the one year rate is what will be paid at t equal to 3 so the value of a floating rate bond at any reset date that is at t equal to 0 or t equal to 1 or t equal to 2 will always be equal to the par value or the notional. So please take a note. Value of a floating rate bond is always equal to par value at any reset date very important this concept. Please note, you could have thought of it yourself also without going into this big proof. What is a floating rate bond? The coupon keeps changing with LIBOR or as interest rate changes, the coupon also changes. In a way, coupon always matches the discount rate. What is the value of a bond for which the coupon is always equal to the yield or the coupon is always equal to the discount rate. So we gave a big proof, none of the books mention this proof just for better understanding. But just remember the value of a floating rate bond will always be equal to par value at any reset date. So moving back to the value of the swap, at least the first leg we have solved the value of the floating rate leg will simply be equal to the par value or the notional. You still need to calculate the value of the fixed rate leg. The value of the fixed rate leg will be as depicted. It will be discounted back by the spot rates. Now just to simplify the depiction the discount factors we will quantify or we will depict by another variable. So we studied discount factors earlier as well. So the discount factor for a particular year i that is zi will be depicted as 1 upon 1 plus ri to the power i. So the one year discount rate z1 will be 1 upon 1 plus r1 to the power 1. 
z2 can be written as 1 upon 1 plus r2 to the power 2. Similarly, z3 will be 1 upon 1 plus r3 to the power 3. So, the value of the floating rate leg, rather the fixed rate leg can now be written as c into n into z1 plus minus is taken common c into n into z2 and c into n plus n into z3. Did this just to simplify the depiction otherwise again and again I have to write the whole 1 upon 1 plus r1 r2. Now the value of a swap at initiation should be how much or the value of a derivative or any derivative instrument at initiation should be how much? It has to be zero otherwise there is an arbitrage opportunity. If it is positive or negative that means one counterparty is in the money to begin with. I will always take that position. So at initiation remember the value of any contract must be zero. Later on one per person can come in the money other can go out of the money as we discussed in the FRA example. But to begin with the value of any derivative has to be equal to 0. So if this has to be equal to 0, that means n minus this figure must be equal to 0. So if this value has to be equal to 0, please verify that c will come out to be 1 minus z3 upon z1 plus z2 plus z3. That is the fixed rate in a fixed for floating swap would depend on the current spot rates. The one year rate, the two year rate, the three year rate and these spot rates as we studied earlier contain expectations of future short term rates. More generally we can say that if this was an n year swap. So we solved it for a 3 year swap. If it was an n year swap, then the fixed rate would have come out to be 1 minus zn, n is the last year of the swap, assuming it's an annual swap, upon z1 plus z2 plus z3 up till zn. So once again, a position in a receive fixed swap, in our example he was a fixed rate payer. If he was a receive fixed, that is a fixed rate receiver and a floating rate payer, then fixed rate receiver would be like a long position in a fixed rate bond offset by a short position in a floating rate bond because he is a floating rate payer. So the duration of this swap would be close to that of the fixed rate note. So the duration of a fixed rate swap, so a fixed rate swap would be value of a fixed rate bond minus the value of a floating rate bond. This is the value of the swap the swap is the fixed rate receiver that means he receives the fixed rate long position in a fixed rate bond will give you a fixed coupon and he pays the floating rate pays the floating means he's a short position in a floating rate bond this will be the value of the swap at any point in time the value of the fixed rate bond minus the value of the floating rate bond if you are asked to compute the duration of the swap that is the percentage change in the value of a swap for a 1% parallel shift in interest rates or a 1% change in interest rates. Then the duration of the swap would be equal to the duration of the fixed rate bond minus the duration of the floating rate bond. Now we just studied that even when interest rates change the value of a floating rate bond is always equal to what? Par value or face value? At least at every reset date, 
the value of a floating rate bond is always equal to power value if that is the case then what is the duration of a floating rate bond duration is the percentage change in the value of the bond for a 1% change in interest rates even if interest rates change the value of the bond remains equal to par value so what is the duration zero there is no percentage change even if interest rates change the value of a floating rate bond doesn't change at any reset date hence the duration of a floating rate bond is equal to zero please note between reset dates the duration will be equal to the time until next reset because for that point the payment has been fixed at t equal to 1 what payment will happen it is fixed here at t equal to 0 whatever was the one year rate at t equal to 0 is the payment that will happen at t equal to 1 so if t equal to 0 has passed and then interest rates fluctuate will the coupon fluctuate no because at t equal to 1 the coupon is fixed so at any reset date duration is equal to 0 just after a reset date or after a reset date duration is equal to time until next reset so it's a very small duration because after this it doesn't matter because whatever is the rate change coupon will also change so duration of this floating rate bond is normally zero or highest it can be the time until next reset so next reset if it's a quarterly swap will just be 3 months if it's a semi annual swap it will be 6 months if it is an annual swap it will be 1 year it can't be more than 1 year the duration of the floating rate bond at best will be one year that is if reset has just happened and for one year now the payment is fixed at any reset date the value is equal to par value so duration of the swap that's why it says is close to that of the fixed rate bond duration of the fixed rate bond will be a duration depending on the maturity maturity is 10 years there could be a 7 year duration maturity is 20 years duration could be 16 17 years so duration of the swap is close to the duration of the fixed rate leg or the fixed rate bond minus the duration of a floating rate bond yes but this is normally not a very big number at a reset date it is always equal to zero otherwise there is a time until next reset let's solve the question consider the following plain vanilla swap party a pays a fixed rate 8.29 percent per annum on a semi-annual basis, and receives from party B LIBOR plus 30 basis point. The current six-month LIBOR rate is 7.35 percent per annum. The notional principal is 25 million dollars. What is the net swap payment of party A? so it's a 6 month swap that is t equal to 0.5 from now the first exchange will happen so the floating rate payment will be whatever is the floating rate at the beginning of the period or whatever is the 6 month rate today is what will be paid 6 months later so he pays a fixed rate of 8.29% so minus 0.0829 Into the notional into six by twelve or one by two is what he'll have to pay. Remember, rate is always annualized, so you have to adjust for the time. Don't make this mistake. And he will receive seven point three five plus thirty basis points. That is seven point six five. So it'll be plus point zero seven six five into the notional into one by two. or the net payment will be equal to minus 0.0829 minus 0.0765 into 25 million divided by 
2 which will come out to be minus $80,000 or the net swap payment of party A would be equal to minus $80,000 since he is receiving less he is receiving only 7.65% on a 6 month basis and he has to pay 8.29% Bank 1 enters into a 5 year swap contract with Mervin Co to pay LIBOR in return for a fixed 8% rate on a principal of $100 million. 2 years from now, the market rate on 3 year swaps at LIBOR is 7%. At this time, Mervin Co declares bankruptcy and defaults on its swap obligation. Assume that the net payment is made only at the end of each year of the swap contract. What is the market value of the loss incurred by bank 1 as a result of the default? So to begin with, this was a 5 year swap or a 5 year contract. So bank 1 would be paying the floating rate and would be receiving a fixed rate of 8%. That's what the agreement is for the next 5 years. Now what has happened is that 2 years have passed. So we are at t equal to 2 and the going rate for 3 years swaps at LIBOR is 7% that is if I long a 3 year swap now or that is if I enter a 3 year swap as a fixed rate pair then for receiving LIBOR I need to pay only 7% this swap is already entered into so for the next 3 years, will this 8% happen? Yes, because I have already entered into the swap for the next 5 years. If 2 years have passed, doesn't mean this swap gets extinguished. This swap still remains for the next 3 years. I will receive my 8% and I will pay LIBOR. Today, if I want, that is at t equal to 2, if I want to extinguish the swap, that is if I want to get out of the swap, I am already in a derivative contract. To extinguish this derivative contract, I need only enter a receive floating party in a new 3 year swap. 3 years are pending to my original contract. I was a pay floating. If in another 3 year contract, I become the receive floating and pay fixed then essentially my cash flows get cancelled out or there is no further risk right now there is a risk if LIBOR goes up I have a risk because I will still receive 8% but I may have to pay a very high rate because I have entered a 5 year swap to pay LIBOR so if LIBOR goes up it hurts me because my 8% is fixed if I enter this 3 year swap wherein I receive LIBOR and pay 7% then have I cancelled my risk because now if LIBOR goes up fine I will have to pay but I will receive here. So enter a 3 year swap as a receive floating pay fixed but now interest rates have probably gone down or expectations of rates has gone down so that current fixed rate is only 7%. When I entered this 5 year swap expectations must have been high so the fixed rate was 8%. Today if I receive floating I have to pay only 7%. So let's enter the swap as a receive floating. So you agree for the next 3 years if I see my consolidated cash flows the LIBOR will get cancelled. I will have to pay LIBOR and I will receive LIBOR. My net payment 
will simply be 1% of 100 million dollars that is 8 minus 7 into 100 so for the next three years I am expected to receive 1 million dollars every year provided Merwin code does not default provided everybody honors their agreement I am going to receive 1 million dollars every year please note swaps are also OTC agreements they are not traded on an exchange swap contracts are also over the counter so there is counterparty risk so I am expected to receive 1 million dollars for the next 3 years all I need to do is compute the present value of these payments today and that will be the value of the swap to me today so I have come in the money because I am receiving 8% and today I rates are only 7% so if today somebody entered he would have received only 7% but I continue to receive 8% so my call has gone right interest rates actually went down and the fixed rate receiver gains how much have I gained I'm expected or I can I, 1 million dollar every year so I have to compute the present value of this 1 million dollars please note the fixed rate on swaps today would also be equal to the yield on a three-year bond or on a three-year treasury bond because this seven percent is the rate that makes the value of the bond equal to par value this seven percent is the rate at which the fixed rate leg has a value equal to the floating rate leg and the value of the floating rate leg is par value because this is a swap at initiation no today's rate at initiation is 7% so at a fixed rate of 7% the value of the bond becomes equal to par value becomes equal to the value of the floating rate leg which is equal to par value so to discount these three cash flows I can use this 7% or the swap rate today so now in the calculator we need only enter n as 3 pmt as 1 because 1 million dollars is coming every year i by y as 7 fe as 0 as nothing else is coming and compute pv which will give me the value of the swap today this comes out to be 2.624 million dollars if mervin code defaults and this is my loss this is the gain that I have assuming Mervin Co makes his payments if Mervin Co doesn't make his payments then this is the value that I'll have to give up or this is the loss please note if the yield of 7% was not given you could have simply individually discounted these cash flows back also if the spot rates were given if the one year rate, two year rate, three year rate was given, no problem. We could have just upon one plus R1, upon one plus R2, upon one plus R3 to the power three. So always in a question on derivatives, first estimate the cash flows and then discount the cash flows back to the time that you are at. Discount back, you need the spot rate for the corresponding maturity. Often in the questions, you will see a lot of extraneous rates. So in the question that we did on FRA, when we needed the two month rate and the five month rate seven month eight month four month all rates will be provided only if you're confident and you've practiced enough questions you'll know which rates to ignore and which rates to use so please practice a lot of questions because right now only the rates that need to be used are being given in the exam questions will be much more confusing they'll give you all sorts of rates so be confident in your calculations so as to know which rate you have to use a multinational corporation is considering issuing a fixed rate bond however by using interest swaps and floating rate notes the issuer can achieve the same objective to do so the issuer should consider
so whatever the answer is should has should have the same cash flows as a short fixed rate bond you're not buying you are issuing a fixed rate bond so your payoff should be something like a coupon for the next three years and then the notional also needs to be paid back so minus c has to be the payoff if you issue a floating rate note of the same maturity if you issue a floating rate then your payoff will be minus l and enter into an interest rate swap paying fixed and receiving floating so you receive floating and you pay fixed the floating will get cancelled what you will be remained with or what will you be remaining with is minus ccc and minus n that is the same payoff as issuing a fixed rate bond all other options these not will not be able to provide the exact same payoff let's see option c so buying a floating rate note of the same maturity if you buy you will receive l and the notional at maturity entering into an interest rate swap paying fixed and receiving floating so you pay fixed and you receive floating floating will again get cancelled but this will be a long position in a fixed rate bond not a short position question didn't ask long a fixed rate bond if long a fixed rate bond then c would have been correct question asks issuing a fixed rate bond hence it has to be option a that is your short of fixed rate bond 